Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. On this episode of the program, we are talking about the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early with director Travis Shakespeare. His movie is called Playing With Fire. The biggest thing that I've noticed is how deep the taboo around money is in our culture, because all that this culture talks about is money all the time. But if you talk to somebody about their own personal relationship with money, it's a big deal. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. It's a big holiday week, and that means that you've got some time, maybe in the next week or so, to watch some movies. I've got a great one to recommend. It's called Playing with Fire. Fire as in financial independence, retire early. We were lucky enough to interview the director, Travis Shakespeare. The movie's available right now on iTunes, Google Play, and it comes with your Amazon Prime membership. U.S. News & World Report just named it one of the best financial films of the decade. Here's a little snippet. Walking out of the office right now, I just quit my job. Whew, that was really hard. My name is Scott Rickens. Like most people, money has never been easy for our family. This year, we're starting our own journey to financial independence. To pick up your life and just move, that is extraordinarily difficult. There's something scary about going, here's what's important to me in life, here's how I'm gonna live my life. We're doing a lot of things at once, changing our entire lifestyle of spending too much money, trying to figure out where we wanna live while still working, while raising a baby. You have to reconcile in your mind that it's gonna be a wild and bumpy ride at times. Can you do a $5,000 car? No. (laughs) I feel like we're gonna need help with this. The math is super, super simple. The thing that's hard though is the psychology. You know, what's all this work for if I can't even live in a two bedroom in a nice neighborhood? What have we done? I've made a huge mistake. Like it was, uh, uh. This has not been an easy journey. This may not work. And if it doesn't work, I've really sold a bill of goods to my wife, to my family. We've invested everything. This has to work. The movie follows a young couple that's just had a child and trying to figure out whether or not they really want to dive into the fire movement. It's really worth watching. And we'll hear from the director, Travis Shakespeare, about how he got involved with this project. So here's our interview with Travis Shakespeare. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. So, hey, Travis, welcome to Jill on Money. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, Jill. I'm a huge fan of yours. Well, hey, we'll get to that in a second. Um, You know, we start our interviews with a big question. What is the best money or career decision that you have made? (laughs) Okay. The smartest thing that I ever did was probably also my biggest mistake, which was I read a book called The Richest Man in Babylon, and In that, they say you should always pay yourself 10% of your income. So I misunderstood that. And when I got my first raise, I I paid myself 10% of the raise, but I saved 90% of the rest. So, you know, I got an extra 100 bucks a week. I allowed myself $10 and I saved 90. Wow. It took me several years to figure out that that was actually backwards. But (laughs) by then, you know, I was like, my savings account had started growing and I was like, oh, well, this works really, really well. If I just keep doing this, maybe, you know, I'll get somewhere someday. Okay, so also let's have full disclosure. Travis, you and I have a previous relationship that you need to disclose for everyone so we don't get yelled at for not saying that we've had, you know, a love affair for a long time. Well, you know, I I called your show before I made the documentary because personal finance is, you know, for me also an issue and I was looking for help. And so I called you. I reached out to you and Mark, and you were kind enough to have me on your show. And so that is really how we began our relationship, which is not a real relationship, everyone. I'm just sort of making fun of the fact that, like, all of a sudden I'm watching this documentary and Mark's like, this dude called the show. And so it was very <laughs> exciting. So, Travis, you are the director and an executive producer, and you've got a ton of stuff on your credits really interesting to me, of course, is that you, you're you all over the place in terms of the types of subjects. What drew you to the FIRE movement? 
when you've done things from, you know, for National Geographic or the History Channel or, um, you know, Ice Road Truckers, what uh, drew you to fire? Well, it really started out as a personal quest for me. Um, I was like so many people in this country, totally financially illiterate. Um, I was a starving artist for the bulk of my career. I just thought someday I was going to win the lottery and that that was going to take care of everything or that I was going to get, you know, a big job in Hollywood and suddenly become super wealthy. What was happening during the time that I was fantasizing about that was I was getting absolutely nowhere financially. I had uh, student loans to the tune of about $40,000 locked in at a 9% interest rate, and I had a bunch of credit card debt. And when my father passed away when I turned 40 years old, and I inherited $75,000, that money allowed me to pay off all of the debt that I had been carrying for the bulk of my, my life. Once I paid the debt off, I kind of panicked because I was like, what am I supposed to do with this $20,000? I had no idea what to do with it. So I started this kind of adventure of trying to educate myself. And that was the beginning of that was really difficult because as you know, the financial services industry is really complex for the average consumer to kind of grapple with. And, you know, I picked up like the intelligent investor because I thought I was smart and I could get through that. And I read that, I tried to read that book and I was just like, oh my Lord, this is a mess. I'm never going to figure this out. But slowly but surely, I came across the FIRE movement through Mr. Money Mustache and also an incredible book, I don't know if you've read it, called Early Retirement Extreme by a guy named Jacob Jacob Lund Fisker, Mm -hmm. who retired on like $300,000 invested in Europe where they have free health care. But he was living on like $1,000 a month. And as, you know, a starving artist myself, I was like, oh, I know how to live like this. If I just follow what these people are doing, maybe I'll save myself. You know, I I had to I had to figure out how to restructure my retirement plan because I had no retirement plan. I I just started following what they did. and, And surely enough, it started working quite fast for me. And how did you find the couple who are the subjects of the documentary? Yeah. So um, in my day job, I produced television shows and um, I had been I had started the documentary because I had gone on a retreat with some of the leaders of the fire movement. And I I was so impressed with what they were doing and with the fact that they were so willing to give this knowledge away for free that I wanted to do something to help in my own way. I'm not a blogger. I'm not a financial expert, but I thought I know how to tell stories And if I can inspire people to think about their financial lives differently, then, you know, maybe I can do it via a documentary. I got waylaid partway through the process with a big job um, at my company to launch a new TV show. And I heard Scott and Scott Rickens, who's one of the people who's featured in the documentary, uh, on a podcast. And I was like, wait a minute, that guy's doing my documentary. This is terrible because he started filming himself, mm-hmm. but he's not a director. So I called him and I was like, hey, do you need any help with this thing? And he was just relieved really because he was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I put myself into this film and like, it's really difficult. And we just struck up a partnership that turned out to be quite extraordinary. I thought it was interesting to really follow the journey of him and his wife and this newborn. And I must say that I felt a little bit old fartish as I was watching it. And and I'll tell you the where where I definitely felt it most. This concept of like, I just, you know, she's telling the story how she is very happy in her career. And I don't understand why she wants to stop. And I say to myself, but don't you have ambition? Like... It's great to raise your kid, but, you know, you do get something very different out of an ambitious career. What's your take on that? I'm, I mean, I am an old fart, so I'll just own it. But, like, I really feel the value of work is so interesting. And I and she wasn't miserable. She said she was happy in her life. Yeah, well, I think the thing that really um, happened for them was that they had a kid, right? Yeah. And she was really happy pursuing her career. But then they realized that they were spending all of their time to generate the money to support the lifestyle that they had been living before they had a kid. And that meant that she had to spend all of her time at work. And she was they were going down the, the route of like the typical, I think, upper middle class family, 
where if both parents are working, you end up spending all this money on on nannies and you know babysitters and whatever so that you can support the career, but then you don't have as much time with the child. Okay, you know? hold on. So so I'm not a parent, so I'm going to interrupt you and 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 make sure that I understand this. So I wasn't clear how much time she was really spending. I did get the part where it's like, hey, we're driving a BMW. We live in San Diego. It's a nice place. It's like we're spending more money. But I was not convinced that she was like working 90 hours a week or anything. She wasn't like some investment banker who had zero life. So what is it about this generation of people who is seeking something very different? I need you to educate me about this because I don't get it because I'm a worker. And even Mark, who is the best executive producer in the world, who just had a baby, also, like, we come from working stock. So what are we missing? Is it just because we love what we do? I, I think there's there's a couple of things here. One is that, in my experience, I don't have kids either, but in my experience of watching women in today's culture, I think that a lot of them really struggle with the dual role of mother and, you know, career champion. I see that in my in all of my friends who've had kids. Mm-hmm. Um, most of them are career driven women, and and they've wanted to have careers, and it's a real struggle, and it's really hard for them. So I think that's number one. Number two, we live in the Instagram world mm-hmm. where we have a whole generation of people who have been well exposed to amazing things every single day on social media. I believe that that has created a desire and a sense of, I don't know if entitlement's the right word for it, but let's say a sense of really possible. You know, you, you, you look at Instagram and you start thinking to yourself at 20 years old, wow, the world really could be my oyster. All I have to do is just get on a plane and go take pictures of myself. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes, I got gotcha. you. But there's a big leap in in like reality between that idea and how, what it takes to get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm also wondering if this is just keeping up with the Joneses on steroids. So that if I wa- if I'm on the Instagram universe, right? And if I am looking at this fear of missing out and like seeing lifestyles and all of this that it compels me to feel like I need to do more and more and more. And then you finally, someone says, well, why are you doing all this stuff for what, right? So the part that I did really relate to in the documentary was the feeling of wanting to own your time and to be more in control. So I always feel like when I interview people about the FIRE movement, the part of the fire movement that I find really important is the FI. The RE Uh is just completely not interesting to me because I don't think most people are going to retire early. I do think the idea of putting yourself in a position to have more control over your life, that financial independence part, that is a core issue that resonates with anyone for any age. I don't want to be beholden to a job or a employer and be at the whims of the economic cycle because that feels so insecure to me. So I guess that I, I am I am mystified in some respects by people who are like, you know, a 27 year old who just sent me an email like I just want to like, you know, learn how to code so I can like be in my bedroom and work. And I say, OK, that's great. But, you know, how are you learning? What What's happening? Where's your interaction? Where is your fulfillment? And again, that might be just me being old fashioned. Well, I don't know if it's you just being old fashioned. I think it's also that our society has changed a lot and the security nets of our society are being eroded continuously at this time. And I think that this generation also realizes that on some level and that they, they understand the urgency of having to take control of their financial life, even if they don't know how that happens. I get that. I, I I get that. I was just in Australia and that place is unbelievable. I mean, everybody's got a savings account. Their minimum wage is like $35 an hour. You know, they're well set up. They get six weeks of vacation a year that they take, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a really functioning society. And when you look back on, on a, the United States and the insecurity that we're creating for our um, citizens, 
um, I can kind of understand why the younger people are like, you know, screw the man. I got to take control of this myself. And yeah. I think that's a big motivator in the fire community. This is Jill on Money. Hey, gang, it's me, Jill Schlesinger. You know that. You're listening to the pod. Certified financial planner, CBS News business analyst, host of this here podcast, Jill on Money. And I am here to tell you about our sponsor, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. They're helping people achieve financial well-being with simple and transparent banking products, including Clarity Money. That's a free personal finance management app that's part of the Marcus family. Clarity Money is your AI-powered financial champion that shows you a simple view of your finances together in one place. They recently launched a weekly budgeting feature that you've just got to try. The app does the hard part for you and calculates your average weekly spend by category. You can take that information so you can set informed budget goals based on what matters most to you. You can also subscribe to budget alerts to help keep you on track and start with a clean slate every week. Who doesn't want that? It's super easy to use and can make a task like budgeting kind of fun. So go check it out. Download Clarity Money through Google Play or iTunes or visit Marcus.com forward slash Clarity. And now back to our interview with Travis Shakespeare. In terms of the community itself, what about that criticism that, you know, another old codger pointed out to me, which is like all these people, whether it's Mr. Money Mustache, that they're really just creating little cottage industries for themselves and that it's all baloney. What I would say to that is that I don't think that Mr. Money Mustache set out to create a, a cottage industry for himself. I really think that he did it because he just wanted to educate people about the possibility. And then it became a huge deal. There are definitely a lot of people who've come along on the heels of that in order to create a cottage industry and to spread the good word, right? Yeah. So some of them are just capitalizing on what's available. And some of them, I do think, really do have a desire to change people's approach. What did you learn by putting this movie together for yourself, better or for worse? The biggest thing that I've noticed is how deep the taboo around money is in our culture. It's just wild to me because all that this culture talks about is money all the time. But if you talk to somebody about their own personal relationship with money, it's a big deal. And what about you and your own financial life. When I started trying to fix my own financial life and I did it through the fire process, what I didn't realize that I, was that I was going to come up against this question of like, am I really going to retire or not? Because, you know, I, I agree with you. Like I like to work through the expansion of my own financial success because of the fire principles. It's allowed me to take greater risks in my own life, mm. right? It's not just about cutting the cord and like sitting on a beach for the rest of my life. I mean, honestly, doing this documentary is a direct result of my wealth because I was able to go to my job and be like, hey, I want to do this documentary and it's a personal side project and I want to carve it out. If I hadn't grown my wealth to a degree that I felt safe to do that, I might not have ever been able to make the documentary. I mean, I think that that's one of the great gifts of being financially independent or having, you know, just plain old savings that you have more choices. You can afford to assume risks that you may not normally have. Or if you're just working or supporting a lifestyle that was way more than you needed, then you wouldn't have yeah. that. I think that what I w really did learn in watching the film was I have zero interest in living like a very minimalist life. And Mark is laughing so hard. I love some of the things that money can buy. And that's one of the reasons mm. I work really hard and I can make, make money is that I do like to go out to dinner or I do want to go on an expensive <laughs> trip and stay in a nonsensical hotel. I like that. OK, so I own that and that's fine. I think I had a greater appreciation for when watching the story of that of this couple's journey and really watching them say, 
you know, what is it about our life that we really want? What are we honoring here? We want to like basically be so into being parents. That's great. It's all wonderful. It's all good. But like, whatever it is that you want, having that goal is incredibly important. So that I think is incredibly useful. I, I really did enjoy it. I, it was fun. It was awful at parts where I was like, no, don't do that. <laughs> but it's, it was great. And so I really do appreciate that. I think that it's going to be interesting to revisit the fire adherence in 10 years and see where they are. That's what I'm going to be interested. I want you to do the sequel. Yeah, I, I, a number of people have said that to me, and I, I do think that'll be really interesting as well. I mean, some of the fire folks have, you know, they they went through the crash. I mean, Christy Shen, who um, is the Asian woman in our documentary, she she and her husband like started investing right before the crash of two thousand eight, and they talk about that in the film. Yeah, we've interviewed um, them. So I I real I, okay. Oh. So I, we interviewed them after their book came out, and we had them on the pod. And the thing that made me laugh was, number one, I said, where's your stuff? Like, because I said, where is your stuff in storage? And they pointed to two backpacks on the floor. And that's when I realized, like, oh, my God, no freaking way. Really? Like, that's it, <laughs> which is good for them. But whatever. I mean, that the backpack they had with, like, their lives in it is smaller than the backpack I had when I was traipsing through Europe 30 years ago when I was a college student. So... I mean, good for them. That's what they want. It just felt so foreign to me. I really, when I tell you, I, there's no moment in time where I feel more like an old fart than when I encounter that kind of situation. <laughs> well, I can appreciate that. You know, that's a, that's the thing. I think I think that what you touched on is really, really the point is the valuation point. Like what is valuable? What is important in my life? I think that's the ultimate point of all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's it's true. Like, most of the people who are really successful that you've heard about that are in the fire movement, they are outliers. I mean, Christy and Bryce are, you know, that's a great example. They live out of a backpack. Mm -hmm. Jacob Lund Fisker lived, I mean, when I read his book, I was like, this guy's living like one step away from a homeless person. Yeah, Grant Sabatier you know? basically said I lived like a very poor person in Chicago for a while. I mean, and I'm is, with you. Like, I don't, I don't want to live like a pauper for the rest of my life. But what I, what I, my, my personal big takeaway is that I have to constantly ask myself, what, what do I really want? What's really valuable here? Yeah. Do I want to buy a new car? I maybe I can afford a new car, but would I rather go on an amazing once in a lifetime trip instead, or help my mom out? You know, in her aging years, like. Hmm. These are the questions that, that you have to ask yourself with around money. None of us can escape money, right? Absolutely. You're listening to Jill on Money. Welcome to the Marcus Minute. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Today in the hot seat, we've got director Travis Shakespeare. His documentary is called Playing with Fire. Okay, Travis, you ready? Yep. What's one word to describe your relationship with money? Partnered. What's always worth spending on? Health. What's the dumbest thing you've spent money on? Clothes. How much do you spend on a haircut? $37. It's your last day on earth. You've got $100 in your pocket. What would you do with it? I would give it to somebody who's going to keep living. Very good. Travis Shakespeare, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. Thanks so much to Travis Shakespeare. Go check out the movie, Playing With Fire. And by the way, while you're out there looking at things to do, hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com. You can listen to past shows or if you've missed any part of this one. You can also watch different things that we've recorded and find our resources. And don't forget, you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We drop new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. Sometimes we squeeze in an extra bonus as well. If you don't want to miss a single episode, subscribe to Jill on Money. You can do that on Apple, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else you find your favorite podcast. And don't forget to rate us. It really does help us improve the program. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We're distributed by Cadence 13. The show is presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. See you next week.